Hello and welcome to this edition of Safe and Secure. We have an exciting show for you today. We have so many topics to choose from. Residents have been encountering internet scams like spoofing and identity theft. And the Southfield Police Department have begun offering specialized training in dealing with active shooter to our library staffers just in case. And who knows, we may get a new recipe from Chief Bassett when he tells us about Chief's Cooking for Kids competition. We'll have all of this and more today on Safe and Secure. The Business 411 Therapy in Southfield with the Southfield Police and friends of the Southfield Police Department have gotten together to make a great donation to the Judson Center, a nonprofit human service agency that provides comprehensive, compassionate service to children and their families throughout Southeast Michigan. So today we're with uh, 411 Therapy, uh, friends of the Southfield Police and the Southfield Police Department all partnered to go out and purchase some coats for the Judson Center uh, after we found out that the Judson Center was looking for uh, purchase of some coats for the kids they work with. So 411 Therapy uh, has been a huge supporter of the police. Um, Hassan Fayed reached out to us and said, hey, I'd like to do something with the community. Um, we had also, on a separate issue, worked with uh, the Judson Center and found out they were looking um, for some winter, uh, you know, sport, or, uh, some coats, some other things like that. So when we were able to, uh, you know, partner the two up and we're here today. The Judson Center is a nonprofit here in Oakland County. We are throughout the Tri-County area. Um, we also have programs throughout the state. We primarily work in adoption and foster care, autism, behavioral health, and adults with disabilities. We serve a number of different folks around our community in any of those program areas. So um, we do have this wish room here that does provide uh, coats and toys and games and um, pretty much anything you can think of for our children in foster care as well as behavioral health. Over 100 coats were donated. And with the money left over, socks and gloves were also bought. The Judson Center, Child Safe Michigan, and the Southfield Police would like to thank 411 for their generous donation. Child Safe, which is an affiliate of the Judson Center, is a foster care adoption and mentoring agency that provides services for abused and neglected children in Southeast Michigan. Teaching life skills, community involvement, increased self-esteem, Caring and consistent relationships, they are dedicated staff providing extensive training and support to mentors and mentees. So here at Judson Center, um, Oakland County, which is our headquarters, we have our affiliate, which is Child Safe Michigan. We do adoption and foster care, as well as our mentor program. And then we also have our Autism Connections program here on this campus. And lastly, we also have our Adults with Disabilities located at this campus. Child Safe is a, we're an affiliate of the Judson Center. We're a nonprofit organization and we do, we place children in foster care and we do adoptions, licensing. A lot of our referrals come, come from children that are in the, in the foster care system. Um, but really any child who just needs additional support in their lives, maybe they've been through some rough times and they just need a, an adult in their life besides a family member or a worker uh, that just will be there just for them so they can build a healthy relationship with someone. Everyone here works very hard, but we're also, we also work as a family because there are some stressful things that happen here with the children that we work with. So this is a very supportive environment to help us in order to help the kids that we serve. Uh, 401 Therapy is a physical therapy location that provides uh, occupational therapy, chiropractor, and physical therapy for uh, workers' comp, auto accidents, um, patients. We were established back in uh, July 2017, um, expanded our business within two years period in the city of Southfield. So with the weather, as you can see outside, and there's a lot of uh, children without coats, uh, unfortunately can't buy a coat, and this is what, when we step in, 
and partner up with the Southfield Police and make it happen for many kids. Right now we, we are in the wish room of Judson Center. This is an amazing room where anybody in the community, whether it's a business, uh, service organization such as the Southfield Police, small business such as 411 Therapy, um, they donate all sorts of items to us throughout the year. So we get animals, stuffed animals, we get back to school supplies, uh, holiday items, gifts, toys, clothing, um, all year round. So this room actually benefits the children that we serve. They can come in here and pick out anything that they want. Um, it could be a need, a want, but it is um, definitely here for them. After the holidays are over, this room gets wiped out. There's literally nothing left. And the Southfield Police Department and Therapy 411 um, came in and replenished all of these winter coats that you see here for our kids that we serve. It's really critical that they have these items. They often leave their homes without anything, literally on their back. Such, you probably hear this all the time. Um, so this room is for them and it's been replenished again um, by our folks today that came over and donated all these wonderful coats. Yeah, so uh, just in recognition um, from the Southfield Police Department, I wanted to present Hassan and uh, 411 Therapy with a plaque um, for all of your help, your generous donation that was able to purchase all these coats today uh, so that we could donate them to the Judson Center. So thank you very much, Hassan. I appreciate Pleasure. it. Thank you. It's a really big surprise to have you all here today, too. To to donate these coats to us. So we really, really appreciate it and all the clothing and bags and bags, which is huge because a lot of our kids do not receive anything. Um, we have a lot of children that are placed in foster care and a lot of times they're removed from their homes unexpectedly. And so they have to leave a lot of times without all their belongings. And so the coats will really benefit these kids, especially now that it's so cold out. Some of these kids may have left their environments without a, a warm coat to wear, so these coats will really help these children out. Child Safe is always looking for um, people to open their homes up for foster care, and we're always looking for mentors. We have a lot of children that need mentors, especially male mentors are very difficult to come by. So we're always on the lookout for good mentors. Um, we have seen some beautiful stories happen through the mentoring program. Um, our longest running uh, match right now is nine years. We recently had a youth stand up in her mentor's wedding. And we also had a, a mentor recently uh, take his mentee to his driver's test and let him use his car and he passed his driver's test. So there's some really beautiful stories that come out and even just the s small stories that these children just really appreciate that they know someone's in their life that's thinking about them. Often when we see uh, law enforcement coming our way, um, we might, might make us a little uncomfortable, but um, they're doing amazing work in the community and reaching out to the greater community to make sure that our greater community has the um, items that they need to survive a long winter. Um, they're always thinking about folks outside of their doors. So not only does this um, gift extend beyond Southfield and Berkeley and Royal Oak, this will go into Wayne County and Macomb and Washtenaw and beyond and Genesee. So um, that will radiate throughout the southeastern Michigan region. And um, the Southfield police are really incredible by always keeping the nonprofit community first, um, which is outstanding. So thank you very much for your service to our community as well. The Judson Center has remained responsive to community needs by providing a range of innovative and quality services. The Southfield Police are proud to be able to support their efforts. I'd like to thank the Southfield Police Department and 411 Therapy for making this happen, donating all these amazing coats and clothing pieces to us. So I cannot thank them enough for their generosity. It speaks volumes to uh, the work that they're doing in the community and we cannot thank them enough. So thank you. Caller ID spoofing is when a caller deliberately falsifies the information transmitted to your caller ID display to disguise their identity. Spoofing is often used as part of an attempt to trick someone into giving away valuable personal information so it can be used in fraudulent activity or sold illegally. Separate. Detective Mike Morish has been with the Southfield Police Department for about 13 years and works in the Digital Forensic Lab. 
He is an investigator and his job entails gathering and presenting evidence for court. And uh, my role specifically is um, to handle all the digital evidence, which can include uh, computers, cell phones, surveillance video, analyzing uh, cell phone towers that get used, uh, basically anything electronic. And so obviously I'm, I'm involved with uh, some of the more uh, elegant electronic crimes that we come across to fraud and uh, impersonation, hacking, things of that nature. As technology evolves and it's becoming more prominent in our day-to-day -day lives, criminals are people who are committing these nefarious acts are leveraging that technology to lower their exposure and still have the ability to, uh, you know, to fraud people or to, to cause harm to others. And so the nature of uh, policing in the digital world is kind of shifting more from a, uh, a traditional method to these now more convoluted and complex electronic methods of obfuscation that criminals are using to obscure their identity. And everybody, just about everybody has a cell phone and it's usually a very powerful computer you know, that we all carry around in our pocket. And uh, the amount of evidence that these devices collect on a minute by minute basis is astounding. Uh, and so when, uh, when we're investigating a crime, a lot of times that device, particularly a cell phone, uh, will prove invaluable in either finding what we call excalpatory evidence, which is something that would uh, help us see that a person wasn't involved or something or was not involved in a crime. Or of course, um, they can be a source of uh, a very deep source of evidence during a prosecution of a criminal case too. So and that extends as well to uh, computers and uh, what we call geolocation records and uh, cell tower analysis, which can kind of give us an idea of where a person is at a, at a particular time. So just recently, the city of Southfield here uh, de deployed an email that uh, went out to all the, all the employees that were in our email domain. Um, I, b I believe it was an Amazon. It, it was coded to look like an Amazon email. Um, just saying, hey, you're, you know, there's a problem with your order. Log in here to, uh, you know, to, to check the status of your order. And what they were trying to do, that in this case, you know, we got lucky. It was a, uh, it was a friendly person who was contracted by the city to, to deploy this and see how um, its, its staff and the employees of the city would respond. And, and what they're doing is they're trying to train and safeguard uh, us against this kind of attack that happens, you know, r randomly. Yeah, I don't know the exact results of that, but I, um, I do believe that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, I think, clicked through and entered there, or, or at least a substantial amount of people uh, clicked through, and, uh, and you know, they captured a lot of personal information, which really comes down to the next thing. Anything that's this important, your bank or your, your lender or your company that you're doing business with is going to make contact with you through a different means. So if, if you have any question about an email not being legitimate, anything, stands out to you as not being right, you're better off just not opening it. There's a technique that criminals use called phishing, where they will, they can take source code right from a, from a legitimate source, like say your bank, for right off their web page, and they can code that into an email and send it to you with a message that might say something like, there's a problem with your account, log in to verify your identity, and it will look identical to uh, your banking page. It will look, unless, unless you're trained and know how to look, it will look very, very similar. Um, and so, the, of course, the lure is for the customer to put in their, their ID and password uh, to log in and, and get to the bottom of this issue. And in fact, what you're doing is transmitting your credentials to a third party who's going to then abuse it. And spoofing is anytime you, you can change email addresses pretty simply so that uh, it will look like a friend is emailing you. Uh, that's possible. There are obviously many, many, many attacks that you can do, and we're not, we won't get into all of those, but uh, suffice to say that that kind of thing and then uh, is, is becoming more commonplace. A lot of the activity that you, uh, that you do on your cell phone, something as simple as sending a, a message, a uh, text message, an MMS message, or uh, doing a web search uh, on the Internet, um, that activity can all be uh, subject to forensic scrutiny later if... Um, if the case demands it and if we get a search warrant for the device. It's, it's usually nine times out of ten it comes down to, yeah, to money. You know, um, that's usually the, usually the end is what they're looking for is money. Yeah. yeah, most of these guys are not, you know, criminal masterminds. This, uh, this information is somebody who is tech savvy, who's grown up with technology. Um, if they know where to look on the internet, they can find a lot of the original code that allows them to carry out these attacks and they don't have to write it. Um, others obviously are much more sophisticated and are writing their own code and they're uh, engineering their own unique attacks and those are the ones that you know that really get people we've heard about all kinds of data breaches in, uh, in corporations and that you know the really technically proficient subset of criminals that's when they make national headlines you know 
ransomware is a is a huge uh, problem right now. And the way ransomware works is you get an email uh, very similar to what we were talking about earlier where you know it might look like it's from your bank or from UPS or from FedEx and uh, it's asking you to click on a PDF or open some kind of file embedded in the email. <coughs> you open that file and uh, all of a sudden no, what's called a malicious payload has been delivered to your computer and what happens is it waits until most of them wait until uh, the, it can look at the, the time in your system clock and know approximately what time it is it will wait until there's a very low probability that you're on your system usually in the morning hours and then it will actually go through make a copy of every single file on your computer and then delete uh, that's encrypted that so the copy is encrypted and then they will delete the original file and then it presents a message to you that demands that you remit payment they, they basically ransom your data back and so we call that uh, ransomware and everybody from hospitals to to police departments you know all, all, a lot of people are, are uh, falling victim to ransomware attacks right now. We've seen some bad guys who've taken what's called a skimmer and they'll install into a gas pump. So they'll come in the middle of the night, open the gas pump. Um, this is a breadboard design that can be readily purchased on the internet if you know where to look for it. It plugs in line directly, the pump gets closed up, and then as people come through and swipe their, their debit or credit cards to make payment for fuel, that account information is captured. And then the really sneaky thing about it, traditionally, the bad guy has had to come back, open the pump, and retrieve that device. And we're finding now on some of the newest designs that I've, I've had a chance to look at that that's not the case. You know, they're, uh, these guys can just pull up to the pump like they're any other customer, open a Bluetooth link on their phone, and download that evidence directly from in. So they never even have to retrieve the device. So uh, it makes it very difficult. Um, but there are some general things you can do to avoid being skimmed. They call that being skimmed when your card is skimmed. Um, just kind of uh, give a give a little tug or a pull. Really take a look and visually inspect the actual slot that you're sticking the card because a lot of times something will just stand out as not being right. It'll look very similar, but it won't be right. Or of course, you can always go in and pay directly with the merchant too, or use cash. I got a call from my grandmother a few years ago, and uh, she said, "Michael, Michael, are you okay?" You know, and I said, "Yeah, what, what's going on?" She said, "Well, somebody called me and said that." Uh, you know that you've been locked up in jail which i found you know was obviously pretty funny uh you, that, and that you needed bail money you know and i told him to go right to hell you know and i got a kick out of that because you know sh thank goodness she recognized that you know that something was probably a miss but what they had done in that case they actually uh found a way to get onto one of my friends facebook pages and saw that i was out of town that weekend in, in this other location and so when they called her to make this demand they actually had a, a very specific piece of information um if something like that were to arise Get the name of the police department where, you know, in this case, your grandson would be locked up and make contact with the police. You know, go on the Internet or go in the phone book, find the number for the police department, contact the police department, ask to speak to somebody who's in charge of the shift and find out what's actually going on before you ever remit payment, uh, you know, to a stranger. There needs to be some best practices going forward to help people be safeguarded from one of these crimes. Um, the, the biggest thing is, if, if you don't understand something, you should speak to somebody, whether that's somebody in the police department or somebody in your family that you trust that's um, more technologically savvy. Um, the first line of defense is always to, to ask somebody if you don't know. And then there are some additional things you can do to really kind of help yourself. The, the first is, um, if you get an email or a text message or a phone call from somebody who is asking you for banking information or wants you to remit payment in either the form of a gift card or a, pre a prepaid money card that that's that's never I've never heard of a legitimate case of that ever happening and so the biggest thing is if somebody wants you to go and get an iTunes gift card or go and get a green dot prepaid money card um, and they're threatening you maybe maybe they're claiming to be a law enforcement entity and um, they want you to remit payment so that a warrant is an issue that's that's one we've been seeing a lot of that's that's not going to be a legitimate that's not going to be a legitimate law enforcement entity. A legitimate law enforcement entity is going to make contact with you in person, um, and they're certainly not going to ask for you to remit payment via a prepaid money card or a gift card. An active shooter is someone who opens fire on a group of unarmed, innocent people. Columbine, Aurora, Newtown are just some of the nearly 100 active shooter incidents worldwide. The threat of random gun violence hasn't diminished. That's why active shooter preparedness training efforts continue to escalate across the country. It may feel like just another day at the office, but occasionally, 
life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. But sometimes bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. The warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. Police department has uh, done extensive training with our officers and our department is ready if we had that unfortunate incident to deal with. But what we see is a secondary mission is now going out into our community and making sure that our residents would be ready if unfortunately they were ever involved in that incident and how to deal with those critical two, three minutes before the officers arrive. So I use that as my comparison. Flying in a plane, safe. Generally speaking, you're safe, but we need to at least talk about it. That makes sense? So our goal is not to scare you in any way. We don't identify the city of Southfield as being a target location. We don't know. Mike Kazilla is uh, with the Southfield Police Department. He's a retired sergeant, but has extensive training uh, with the county and other national programs that he's brought back to the city. And he shares with us best practices and how best for residents and our community to respond to these situations. Our goal today, again, our goal today is not to scare you, okay? As you'll see by the numbers that we're gonna be talking about, in relative terms, you spread these numbers of these incidents across the country, there's not a ton of them. So our risk for any one of us to be really involved in an active shooter event is really quite low. Disaster response psychology, we're gonna talk about how people behave in general in high stress events. Oh yeah, we have confrontations quite a bit. Not any major, major, deals, no big issues, but uh, quite a few confrontations with people. And um, in the event that something like that does happen, we're really close to the police department, for one. So that helps a lot. That helps uh, tremendously. So um, major, major deals are handled pretty much by them. Well, some of those instances are parents exchanging children, custody type situations we have a lot of that type thing going on and a lot of times the two parents or, the, or both bodies will get or are highly upset about something that's going on internally with those people personally so we've had a few of those incidents also the one instance was two two parents um the mother the mother and stepfather were bringing the child to meet with the the biological father and the two men decided that they were going to have a confrontation. They, they yelled and screamed at each other and one guy even took a swing at the other one. So that happened in the lobby area and, and the police had to be called for that situation and they took care of it right away. There's two primary programs that you'll hear people talk about and I just want to tell you the difference as to well, why do we talk about avoid, deny, defend when there's run, hide, fight? Or why are we talking run, hide, fight? Here at the library, we have had patron confrontations with staff or patron on patron confrontations, which we would have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. But also we would have to know what to do as far as our own safety and precautions that we need to take in order to continue or to stay safe. We have a tendency to do what they did, go to the ground, not move, that type of thing. And they basically, I hate to say it, is that they waited until the threat really got there type of thing. Four minutes that call lasted, by FBI estimates, was 12 minutes from the time the shooting started till they entered into the library. So in four minutes, how far can you move? In 12 minutes, how far can you move? Okay, so that's really the kind of the, the point behind this is figure out a plan is that if, you're, if you don't think that you can get out and we're going to talk about the difference. You don't think you can get at least barricade the door and put some obstacles in the way so they, they just can't come in and have free reign. You know, do something. Don't just go there and wait. You know, either get out, barricade yourself in, get ready to fight, and we'll talk about all those stuff. Does it make sense? Okay. We need to learn what our natural tendencies are. Again, I'm not saying that 
everybody here would do that, but some people, that's what we would have that tendency to do, okay? I thought that the instructor was really good. Um, he brought some really interesting perspectives to um, the training. He'd been through a lot of training with Oakland County and doing it for the police there in like the courthouse area up on Telegraph. Um, and he was able to translate like the different concepts he was talking about into the space that we have here. You know, because every building is different. Every like, I don't know if you can hear, there are littles in here, there are a lot of little kids. When you have different ages, that makes a difference. When you have um, different abilities, that makes a difference. A lot of times we get volunteers in here from JVS who may have some uh, developmental delays. So when you have to deal with people that are not, um, you know, that are a little bit different, sometimes you have to make sure that you have different ways to get out of the building if it would not fire or any other kind of an emergency uh, where they need to shelter if there's a tornado or uh, any other type of thing like that. So we made sure to go around afterwards and since I'm newer I wasn't sure exactly where everything was so I found out where all the emergency exits were, where all of the fire extinguishers were, where the pull boxes are and how to get out of the building if we need to. It's, it's a way of just being more aware, um, not being fearful. Because especially if you're an employee here and you have people in the building and you need to, you know, help shepherd them into whatever area, if there's a tornado or a fire, you need to be calm about it. Justin, I thought it was a great training. Uh, and I thought the Southfield uh, Police Department's um, retiree did a great job. You know, I made a point because I am newer to go up to the other floors just in case I was on a different floor to find out where the emergency exits were and where the fire extinguishers were, that type of thing. I think it was really useful. The, the police department's ex very excited to get this program out to our community, to as many members of our community as we can. And we see this as our mission to prepare our residents for an unfortunate tragedy. So the cooking competition, uh, you know, my, my predecessor, Chief Hawkins, has done it for a number of years before me. And, this year I had a chance to participate. Uh, it's in conjunction with the Youth Connection, which does a lot of great work um, in the city and throughout the entire metropolitan area with our young people and some of our uh, under-resourced young people who don't maybe have some of the, the access to different events and different um, you know, resources. It gets very competitive with all the different chiefs trying to make sure that uh, they win. Well, you have to submit three different recipes, um, a hors d'oeuvre, <laughs> a entree and then a dessert and then actually what happens and this is I don't know if I'm releasing the secrets but actually a professional chef prepares one of those three that you've submitted so you submit something either you know that's been in your family or just something that you know a, a particular dish you really enjoy and you make and then a professional chef actually prepares it for you because you have to kind of um, uh, up the quantity quite a bit for the event so a professional chef comes in uh, it's a lot of fun, you know, so you know, my job is really, I don't have to worry about preparing the food that night. My job is to go out there and try and sell it that evening to all the different people who are you know, good enough to come out for this great event. My main skill in the kitchen is eating. Um, I'm very good at it. I don't, I don't want to brag, but I am very good at eating. Um, I don't know that preparing the food is something I'm quite as good at, um, but luckily I have an amazing wife. And even now, I'll say my 11-year-old daughter is starting to, to pick up the skill and she really loves it, but I, I can prepare very simple things, but I, again, my skill set is eating and I know what, what, what I like and what I don't like. Uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't win this year, but next year I'm gonna come back bigger and better and I, I think I can take it next year. Well, that's it for this edition of Safe and Secure. We hope that you found today's show informing as well as entertaining. To find out more about the police and fire department, visit our website at cityofsouthfield.com forward slash police or fire. You can also go to our Facebook or YouTube channels. So until next time, stay safe, safe and, and secure. secure.